Beside the Brook, Chapter 5, A Storm Farmer Wilmot decided to keep the sheep longer than he had first intended, partly because the experiment promised success, and partly to retain the services of the shepherd on the farm. The sheep had been moved all over Pacific Ocean, so that the field was ready for winter ploughing, and now they were quartered in an adjoining field, from whose enclosing hedges of blackthorn and crabapple great oak trees rose at intervals. A lane ran along one side of the field, separating Farmer Wilmot's ground from that of his neighbours. This was a beautiful country, though the fields were flat in the river valley. Copses of hazel, oak and beech encroached upon the farms, and in some sandy patches woods of fir trees with very straight trunks lent variety to the landscape. In these little coniferous copses the rabbits loved to fling the white sand about and honeycomb the ground with tunnels below the patches of heather that grew there. One could see their paw marks fresh each morning on the darker coloured damp sand thrown out during their nightly digging. One had to be careful in walking over these patches, lest a foot should sink through the frail surface into the rabbit galleries below. Mr. Jupe, the gamekeeper who haunted these woods, was the most sure-footed authority on them. The admiration of all the boys who knew him, because he could ride a bicycle with a loaded gun under his arm. He was also their terror, especially during the bird nesting season. It did not matter how carefully and quietly anyone trod through these woodland sanctuaries at that time, Mr. Jupe, who seemed to be everywhere, would appear from behind trees in his khaki garb with a face that betokened trouble. In his presence one could never find good enough reasons for being there, owing to a very sick feeling in the stomach. Deeper in the woods Mr. Jupe had an establishment consisting of hut and gallows, on which he hanged all the thieves of the district. Crows, jays, kestrels, and cats. Occasionally he skinned the four-footed marauders and nailed the pelts on the nasty-smelling board. It was heather that covered with purple patches the blue hills Teddy could glimpse beyond the river. Those hills reminded him of days long ago when he roamed in glens knee-deep in heath to gather birch twigs for brooms and blayberries for jam. To hear his sheep bleating in tones high and low this still clear autumn morning was joy to the shepherd's ear. The red and gold bramble leaves were spreading with spider's curtains through which showed red hips and blue sloes. The dew that sparkled everywhere had just escaped being turned to frost, and flocks of rooks wheeled and cawed in the sky, pleased to rejoin the great rook clan of last winter. The throb of a distant thrashing machine and the chopping of a woodman's axe could be heard between the sheep bleating, and the smoke of a bonfire drifted across the field, tending the bonfires of Cooch Grass was Teddy's programme for that afternoon when he had finished with the sheep. A wind sprang up as morning advanced, and the dew disappeared quickly. A woodpecker in the fir trees uttered her warning, click, 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 as if she knew that the towering pink clouds gathering on the horizon meant a storm. Teddy straightened himself and looked at the sky. There's bad weather brewing, he said to himself. The morning was too bright and the dew cleared off too quickly. The woodpecker's cry had told him something as well, but he resumed the work which kept him busy for another hour. By that time strange brown clouds had covered the sky, screening the sun. A muffled roar rumbled around the horizon. 
the thrashing machine ceased to hum its sleepy up-and-down song, and soon afterwards the woodman's axe stopped. The sheep huddled among the hurdles. Teddy had looked them all over. They were worried and uneasy at the coming thunderstorm. They wouldn't take harm, the shepherd assured himself, as the brown clouds thickened overhead, for they're in the open way from the trees. Then the clouds opened, and down came the rain. Remembering his rheumatism, Teddy whisked a big sack from a hurdle, and draping it around his shoulders, crouched in the angle of the oblong curdle enclosure, and waited for the storm to expend itself. Soon the sheep were crowding round him as if they drew comfort from being close to him. "'You need not to be frightened, my bairns,' he said. "'I'll not leave you.' And they seemed to listen to his voice. Teddy scanned the fields. The treetops threshed wildly about, while rain swept in sheets across the expanse, tumbling the rooks about the sky. Then a white flash blinded him to everything. A tearing sound split the heavens above him, and the sheep cried in fear as an awful rumble reverberated over the land. Almost immediately the rain ceased its hissing. The sheep seemed to hold their breath, and in the dead silence that followed could be heard the agitated hum of a bumblebee too burdened with late honey and drenching rain to fly. But in another moment the downfall poured again. White fire streaked towards the tallest oak in the hedgerow, and the instantaneous shriek that rent the air was not that of thunder, but of the stricken tree, cleft from crown to root as though gashed from heaven with an almighty chopper. Then came the crashing of boughs amidst a terrific outburst of thunder. The sheep wailed piteously, burying their heads in each other's wool, while Teddy pulled his sack over his head like a tent and spoke calmly. Never mind, never mind, the storm will soon pass. And indeed the worst had passed. A belt of pale green sky extended across the horizon opposite the storm. The thunderclouds rolled, crackling and terrible, towards the forest, while the torrent of rain abated to a slow drizzle. Lifting up their heads, the sheep sniffed, then curling up the corners of their mouths, they broke away one by one from their huddle and fell to munching swedes again. The bright sky expanded till it stretched overhead. Out came the sun and Teddy looked for the rainbow. There it was, its beautiful arch spanning the indigo thunderclouds. Brilliant as it was, another appeared above it. How marvellous are thy works, said the shepherd, casting off the sack and stretching his cramped limbs. An awful sight met his gaze. Where the tallest oak had stood an hour ago lay a tumbled wreck of broken and scorched limbs through which projected a fan of gigantic splinters, once the trunk. Teddy approached the devastation. Leaf clumps and splinters strewed the ground. The seared barbed wire had snapped and coiled into springs each side of the torn hedge and a dead partridge lay dishevelled on a mat of its own feathers. The shepherd took off his hat. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedar trees, he murmured aloud, with eyes transfixed by the enormous heap. So rapt was he by the colossal wreck that he did not notice the arrival of a young man behind him. The woodcutter, for it was he, had come in time to hear Teddy's observation. The shepherd turned round surprised to find a healthy-looking youth regarding him. His green dungaree suit was open at the neck and rolled high above his elbows. In his right hand he carried a heavy axe. "'What a sight is this?' said Teddy. "'Where were you when the tree was struck?' Hiding below a bush in the clearing, replied the young man, I was lopping branches from the felled timber 
when the thunder came, so I laid down my axe. It would not have been safe to wield that blade in the presence of such lightning. Were you with the sheep? Yes, the poor things were frightened, but they've forgotten it all anew. Together they examined the wreckage. It will be a job for us to clear it up, said the woodcutter. Hello, it's nearly dinner time. Come and I'll show you a dry spot to sit down, and have yours too, if you don't mind my company. Mind your company, laughed Teddy. Perhaps I shall enjoy it. The young man led the way to the wood where stood a kind of ambush evidently erected by Mr. Jupe, from where he might stalk his furred and feathered enemies. Consisting of a wooden framework, its walls and roof were padded with heather and riddled with holes where mice and wrens disported themselves. The dry sandy floor was furnished with an inverted hencoop and an empty cartridge box which served for seats. A dry haven, remarked Teddy, looking around and seating himself on the box. Then opening his straw bag and producing his bread and cheese, he gave thanks for the food. The young man did likewise. I see, he said to the shepherd, that you fear God. I do, replied Teddy and every honest man should. Fear God and keep his commandments, that is the whole duty of man. The woodcutter's blue eyes sparkled as from the recesses of his hip pocket he brought out a small Bible. I read this every day, he said. Teddy Ting Tong perked up, for he had caught sight of something familiar. Why? he exclaimed. There is the same kind of wee book that tells me every day what to read. I have one, though I didn't know the name of it, for the covers are gone. It's called The Bible Companion, said the woodcutter, passing it to Teddy. It has helped me to find out a great deal about the scriptures, said Teddy, and perhaps you can help me to find out more. It will be a great joy to me if I can have that privilege, replied the young man. Let us read a portion for today, October the 17th, when we have finished our meal. So after they had dined, the young man read aloud chapters 9 and 10 from the Gospel according to John. Teddy listened to the story of the blind man to whom Jesus gave sight. With wrinkled hands upon his knees and eyes on the sandy floor, the shepherd missed not a word while the young forester read on, in his pleasant voice. And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe and he worshipped him. Here the shepherd nodded his head vigorously as if he meant, that's just how I feel. But the young man continued with the next chapter, which appealed to the old man still more. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Wonderful, wonderful, said Teddy at the conclusion. It's as if a new light has dawned on me as the blind man to hear those words read by another. I must see you again, Mr. Gray. Edward Grey, said the shepherd. My name is Kenneth Summers, and here is my address, said the young man. Now for the axe. Beside the brook, chapter 6, Kenneth visits Mr. Tingtong. 
Kenneth Summers was not a forester by birth, but a townsman who had left a good clerical post and become a countryman. During the war, the tribunal before which he had appeared on his refusal to fight had required him to take up forestry or agriculture. Gladly choosing the former, he had attached himself to a new forest timber company, and though family and friends seem remote, he felt amply compensated by the life of freedom, purity and beauty into which he entered. Now that the war was over, he hoped to continue in the simple life which, though it offered little hope of getting rich, promised peace and enough freedom from the cares of this life to enable him to study the things that mattered. These things concerned truth. Wise parents had put him in the way of it, and on reaching years of understanding, he fully grasped the relationship between man and his Creator, and had accepted the principles whereby man is offered salvation from death and promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. The truth mattered a great deal more to Kenneth Summers than the prospect of worldly advancement. While some of his school friends had won honours in the fight and prestige for the rest of their lives, he had endured taunts of cowardice and an attitude of disapproval from respectable people. Other folks are dying for you, had been a frequent taunt. One man has died for me, and I need no other to do so, had been his answer. He intended now to refrain from worrying about the immediate future and to stay in the forest until circumstances arose to point out the next step. And in this he was helped by those words of the Master. Take no thought saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There were the birds to watch, the pigeons who clapped their wings loudly in their descent upon the clover field, the tree creepers running spirally up tree trunks securing their fill, the finches feeding off thistle seed, the kingfisher streaking along the forest brook like blue lightning, and the lonely heron wading like a ghost in some woodland pool, the nimble wrens darting furtively like mice in the undergrowth, and the game birds waxen fat by the natural plenty of autumn woods. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? There were lilies, too, to consider in this forest, not the same as those flaming beauties that Jesus regarded in Palestine, but a succession of lovely bulbous flowers. The first appeared in January, when fragile snowdrops pushed their points through the veils of obstructing dead grass and leaves. Kenneth searched for them before the snow went, and often found the infant flowers wearing a collar of dead oak leaf. Such is the insistence of life that the frail bud will pierce its covering rather than be denied light. And before the snowdrops had returned to earth, there were wild daffodils gilding the floor of the woods before the ceiling was yet green, to be followed by stretches of turquoise beauty in May, when bluebells stood like tiny shepherd's crooks laden with heavenly blossom. There were glades, too, where the strange and lovely Solomon's seal curved beneath the beeches, and one spot hidden by bracken from vulgar gaze where the wild gladiolus enjoyed sanctuary. Kenneth considered them all. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? 
It was not improvidence that Jesus had recommended to his followers, but trustful confidence in God. Kenneth thought much when he hewed or sawed alone, but sometimes when the work was heavy and every muscle was taut in helping to hoist the sticky fir trunks to the timber cart, or contracted to avoid the recoil of an oak log, his mind eased off too tense to consider anything but the affair of the moment. Preoccupation then might spell disaster, so that the labour in the sweat of his brow, which is the present lot of man, made thinking impossible. He met other men at the sawmill, some who, like himself, had undertaken forestry because of their religious convictions. Some who were godless, hardened men, only working, eating, drinking, smoking, and forgetting that they must die. Between these extremes were honest workmen, of no particular virtue or vice, content to dwell in a quiet way, exercising their minds with no concern beyond home or family. One of these, a Mr. Sprackling, a bachelor of about sixty-five years, lived with his dog in a hut equipped in much the same manner as Teddy Ting Tong's. Nearby were stabled his two massive timber horses, Snowball, all white, and Queenie, all black, who had both developed such a degree of intelligence through close association with Mr. Sprackling as to surprise the unwary. This was Kenneth's fourth autumn in the woods. He loved and looked forward to each season in its turn, and if in November he remembered the freshness of spring with its new life and glad bird song, or the shady beauty of summer woodland and the bright common where heather stained with purple the hazy landscape, and gorse pods crackled in the heat, he did not look back regretfully for there was a dignified loveliness about the autumn. Trees dripped steadily upon leaf mould enriched by the recent fall. The chestnut hung out a few leaves like a golden fish, and the beech was garnished with a thousand yellow coins, while haunting fragrance rose from the sodden earth where lay the lichen-covered logs awaiting removal. Kenneth looked for the mosses and bright fungi that now came into their own. The scarlet catfly agaric toadstool, with its white spots that flourish below fir trees, the yellow jelly fungus and the stiff brown bracket growing on dead wood, the trumpet lichen and sphagnum moss. He knew where to find them all. Long, watertight boots protected him from rain pools in the deep ruts, and he thoroughly enjoyed feeling the storm drops patter on his oilskin cape. He was too busy to be cold, and his hunk of bread and cheese around the wood fire that blazed with dry chips from the mill satisfied his needs. But daylight grew so short that by the time he arrived at the shilling one evening after tea, Teddy Ting Tong had already lit the small oil lamp suspended from the rafters and coaxed a little coal fire to glow in the grate. I'm right glad to see you, Kenneth, my boy, was the shepherd's greeting as he wrung the forester's hand. Draw up to the fire. I'll make another cup of tea. It'll no come amiss. The tin kettle was singing, and soon the sociable fragrance filled the hut. Thank you, Mr. Gray, said Kenneth. So you didn't forget I was coming tonight. Forget? exclaimed Teddy. How could I forget when you bring good tidings of great joy? That's how you regard it? asked Kenneth happily. I do indeed, replied the old man earnestly. Perhaps it means more to me than to you, for I have already passed the allotted span. You are but a child to me. I'm twenty-two, said Kenneth. Aye, said Teddy Tington. I remember when I was a laddie like you. 
We spend our years as a tale that is told. I'm near now to the end. And that's why the good tidings mean more to me than to you. I must know it all before I pass off the scene. Kenneth looked steadily at the shepherd. Because you're old and I'm young, it does not follow that the truth means more to you than to me, he said. I may be crushed by a load of timber tomorrow. Life hangs by a thread many times between birth and death. True, replied Teddy. It behoves us all to be ready. For young and old, the principal thing is to seek wisdom. In one way, youth has the advantage, continued Kenneth thoughtfully. For to understand truth when one is young gives one the chance to serve and please God throughout a lifetime. I agree, replied the shepherd. But the labourers called at the eleventh hour likewise received their penny. Kenneth smiled. You are right, Mr. Gray, he said. Do you understand that, should you die in the faith before I do, you would not receive your reward before I do, if I deserve one? Is that so? asked Teddy. Yes, replied Kenneth, and bringing out his Bible, opened it at the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11. This chapter, as you know, is an account of those people of God who were proved by faith, and in the last two verses we read, These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Oh, said Teddy, nodding understandingly. And again continued Kenneth enthusiastically. Peter in his second letter to the Thessalonians says this, We who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or forestall those who are asleep. You see, explained Kenneth, that those who are alive when the Lord returns will have no advantage over those who are dead. I do see, said the shepherd, I see that when I die I shall stay in the grave until the Lord return. Exactly, said the young man. The dead are truly dead, and that is without life. Hear what the psalmist says in Psalm 146 about a dying man. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Again in Psalm 39. Oh, spare me that I may receive strength before I go hence and be no more. Yes, said Teddy, I well remember puzzling over the wise man's words in Ecclesiastes. The dead know not anything. When mother died, for the parson told me then that she was happy in heaven. There's no one in heaven except God with Jesus at his right hand, and the angels, said Kenneth. Peter taught that David had not ascended into the heavens, and if he, the man after God's own heart, is not there, on what ground should any of us enter in? Where will the blessed ones receive their reward? asked Teddy. Here on the earth, asserted Kenneth. The earth hath he given to the children of men. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein for ever. That explains much that I could not understand before, said the old man. Those words of the prophet, he shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And indeed this earth is beautiful. I always thought it would be a shame to leave it for good and all at death. It will be an earth purified and free from the curse that descended on it after Adam's sin, said Kenneth. Where does it say that? asked Terry. 
in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. There shall be no more curse. Then that will be something to live for, observed the shepherd, though the chief joy will be to serve the master when his glorious presence is on earth amongst us. You do not need much convincing of the truth, Mr. Gray, said Kenneth. And that's because it is a simple faith, and God's word cannot be broken, answered the shepherd. His glance travelled towards the photograph. Mother was a good woman, he said, and I know now that she's unconscious in the grave. She was my wife, though we called her mother, for the sake of my son. So you have a son, Mr. Gray? Yes, but where he is I cannot tell. I've not seen nor heard of him for twenty years and more. I'm sorry, said Kenneth, and there was silence. Listen to the wind and rain. The branches threshed up and down as the rain beat in gusts against the hut and during the intervals in the wild night could be heard the rushing of the brook whose waters had swelled in the storm. Together they talked of life and death till the hour grew late, and when the ceasing of the rain suggested that here was Kenneth's chance to go home, he rose to go. Mr. Gray, he said, I believe I can say to you as Jesus said to a certain man, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. I trust you may be right, replied the shepherd. Call me Teddy, as the children do. <laughs>